Um, look to Ezekiel, or uh, Ezekiel 47. And if you'd find uh, that, we're going to start in Ezekiel. If you happen to uh, notice Zechariah on the way by, we'll be in Zechariah 14. And uh, we'll be a couple other places too, but they'll be easier to find. Um, am I better off doing something different here, Johnny or Nathan? Are you guys okay? Should I use a different mic? Come and get me a mic stand. Come on up here and take charge. I got to keep these people from falling asleep. Um, in Ezekiel chapter 47, while Nathan gets a microphone arranged for me. Um, and then Zechariah 14. Just a quick word of review. We have, we, we've been going through covenants and, and specific ways God deals with people. And um, all scripture, let's start with this. All scripture is profitable for doctrine. I think somebody can sneak it behind me. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, all scripture. The whole book, Genesis to Revelation, it's all profitable. It's all a help to us. It's all, it, it's all important. But there are some things that we can look at that can be, when we start saying doctrinally, devotionally, spiritually, um, you see Abraham taking his son Isaac up to Mount Moriah, there are lessons to be learned about self-sacrifice, about trust. Um, there's so many good lessons in there, in pictures of the blood atonement, but um, what happened on Mount Moriah was between Abraham and God, and it had to do with uh, his faith in God. You got it all together? You there almost? So um, tonight we're gonna we're gonna wrap these lessons up, and I want to talk to you about the final. Uh, there's a, there's a, a final covenant here that we. Seed his children. So you can shut this this one off. Then maybe Johnny, uh, the big funny looking one. Um, his seed would be. It'll take a minute for them to figure this out. Um, he'd have lots of kids like the stars of heaven. Also, all the world would be blessed. There were several things involved in the covenant God made with Abraham, and that's unconditional. It was settled. And um, you, you, can you hear the echoing and stuff up there? Or is that the mics? Uh, the something on the platform. Okay, then David brought us the covenant that there would be his seed would be on the throne forever and ever. In between David and David and uh, Abraham was Moses, and Moses gave us what? The law, covenant of the law, the rules. There's a there's the land was promised to Israel through Abraham. The law of the land, how the land to be run was through date was through Moses, and when they violated that law, they got kicked out of the land. And then there would be a king. If you're going to have a land and you're going to have a law, you have to have a king. And that would be through David. The son of David would be on that throne forever and ever. Then, and that goes through all the way to the time of Christ. And we did not going to take time to review, but in John chapter one, it says the law and the prophets were until John. So there's a stopping point. John, Romans 10, 4 says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So there's a stopping point. There's a change. We all understand that in the Old Testament, they couldn't eat shrimp. And glory to God, hallelujah. In the time of, of the, the New Testament church, we can eat shrimp. And uh, I was somewhere the other day and had a plate, three different kinds of shrimp on one plate. Couldn't get any better than that unless you could find a fourth way to cook shrimp. And... Um, this morning, my wife and I had bacon, praise God, and, uh, and eggs, but it doesn't matter what else you eat. If you have bacon, it's all good. But in the Old Testament, we understand you couldn't have bacon. Who wants to be an Old Testament Jew? What a terrible life. You couldn't have a pork chop, couldn't have pork roast, no pulled pork sandwiches, no pork ribs, and no, no head cheese. I mean, what would we do without? How many of you ever had head cheese? Or just a few people that are real country. I watched my grandmother cook it and I refused to eat it I wouldn't even taste it absolutely not said no grandma I love you I'm not eating that that's nasty but anyway um that was out of the when, when you carve what's left on the skull of a pig and you put it into a meatloaf pan and bake it you, I mean nobody should eat that that is just 
And that's really what it is. You that don't, I'm not exaggerating. This is not preaching now. This is the truth. So, um, but in the Old Testament, they couldn't have pork. And if it, uh, it had to divide the hoof and chew the cud and all these different. But, and we know that's not true in the New Testament, right? So there are things that are different. And so we are going to today, I'm going to bring you to the very last. There's a, 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 an eternal covenant of a kingdom. And there's all kinds of names you could put on it. But I want you to look with me. Bottom line is, summarize it. Tonight we're looking at how the story ends. How about this? Title the message, Happily Ever After because it really is good. All right, look with me at Exodus, Exodus. Give my glass, I think it's Ezekiel. Oh, look at there, it's Ezekiel, not Exodus. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 47, and if, um, Ezekiel chapter 47, I had handouts for the afternoon Bible study, but vacation Bible school happened, you don't get a handout. You're gonna have to just read and take notes. But Ezekiel 47, now, um, again, if you've not been here in the prior weeks, you're kind of out of the loop, but don't worry about it. Um, let's look at chapter 47, verse 1. Afterward, he brought me again under the door of the house. That house is the temple on the, the, the site in Jerusalem. That's the real Jerusalem today. Only it will be, this is after the tribulation. This is, um, this is the kingdom uh, temple. It's going to be. Um, he brought me to the door of the house. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. And the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came out from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. And so we talked last week, and I think I had a picture that this water, there's literally a fountain coming from the throne of God, and it flows east, and it ends up at a place called En Gedi, and down into the, the Dead Sea, and it heals the Dead Sea. And we'll read about that in a minute, and I'll show you just exactly where it is. Um, so he's standing there. And, um, and I'm skipping through because there's so much scripture here. Um, and, uh, and, and so he begins to measure and he goes out a thousand cubits, which would be 1500 feet. And um, the water's ankle deep. It goes out another thousand cubits, it's, it's waist high. And then finally so much he can't swim. And the river's getting big raging river all coming out of the throne of God. One goes west toward the Mediterranean. One goes east toward the Dead Sea. And it's all out of the throne of God. And then if you go down with me to verse seven, and he says, now when I'd returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and the other. Then said he to me, these waters issue toward the east country and go out down into the desert and out into the sea, which brought forth into the sea and the waters shall be healed. Now, if you wanna, if you don't have marks in your Bible, you might write down next to that verse, Zechariah 14, verse eight. And that'll be a cross reference that we'll, we'll look at it in a minute. Look at verse nine. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish because these waters shall come thither for they shall be healed and everything shall live whither the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from En Gedi even in, in Eglium they, um, they shall be a place to spread forth nets and their fish shall be according to their kinds as the fish of the great sea. So he says the fish that are gonna be in the Dead Sea are gonna match the fish that are in the Mediterranean. Right now the Dead Sea's dead, but the waters coming out of the throne of God are gonna heal the Dead Sea and everywhere in between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea is gonna be healed and there'll be, it'll be a plush garden. There's a lot more scripture on that and it'll be a, a, just like the Garden of Eden was. And uh, anyway, so holding that just for a moment, um, just hold it because we're going to come right back. Go over to Zechariah 14 if you're comfortable flipping around. If you're not, just listen and we'll be there in a moment. If you find Zechariah chapter 14. Now, God promised Abraham, what was the main promise to Abraham? Land, right? Promised Abraham his seed would inherit the, remember in the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, um, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit thee earth, not a heavenly inheritance, an earthly inheritance. We are looking at an earthly, uh, an earthly city, Jerusalem. We're looking at an earthly temple in that city. We're looking at an earthly river flowing down to an earthly dead sea that becomes the live sea. I don't know what they rename it, but they can't keep calling it the dead sea. Um, the river that'll flow to the Mediterranean. And you're going to see here, there's all kinds of people involved in this story. And so this is on earth. This is dirt. 
and rocks and trees and water and fish and all kinds of things. So Jesus said in John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. So he left the earth, right? Everybody with me on this? And he goes to prepare a place for his bride and it's not on earth. So we're looking tonight at two different places. On the earth, we've got the temple and that temple is where in Jerusalem where um, the, 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 the river we just read about and a bunch of other things we're gonna see in a minute. Then there is the New Jerusalem. We'll look at it in a minute in Revelation. And there's a New Jerusalem. You know why there's a New Jerusalem? Because there's also an old Jerusalem. You are so smart for being Wednesday night. That means there are how many Jerusalems? Could be a dozen of them. I think there's a Jerusalem, Ohio, a Jerusalem, Mississippi. I don't know. But anyway, the two, the two that count, one's in Israel and one is up in the city of the north. All right. Look at uh, Zechariah chapter 14. And um, again, there's a lot more here. This is just kind of an overview. Um, look at verse eight. And by the way, if you want to see when Jesus comes back, that's in verse four. He splits the Mount of Olives. And that might be when the, the great cavern comes where the water will run down to the Dead Sea, perhaps. But that's, that's nothing to do with tonight. Verse eight, uh, Zechariah 14, eight. And it shall be in that day that what kind of waters? Drinking at the springs of living water. A lot of our hymnal songs are right out of the Bible. It should be that way. Uh, living water shall go forth from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea. That would be the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. In the summer and the winter shall it be. And the Lord, now notice in verse 9, Zechariah 14, 9, the Lord shall be king over all the what? So we're talking about what kind of a kingdom? It's an earthly kingdom. We all good with this? Now, I know this is so obvious. And if you've not been exposed to wrong teaching, you won't understand what's the big deal about right teaching. But once you start hearing wrong teaching, you think, man, that guy's crazy. The Bible says this. And the best way to know what false doctrine is, is to be very familiar with right doctrine. And that's what we're looking at here. So the Lord, verse nine, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, there shall be one Lord and his name one. All the what? All the land. This is an earthly kingdom. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon. Now, if you were here last week, Jerusalem and that whole plateau is raised up to a flat plain. And we had a picture of it last week, but we don't have it this week because nobody's here that, that knows how to do anything. And it shall be lifted up. I'm sorry, Nathan's here, but we're not going to use it, Nathan. Don't worry about it because it's too late. So it's all going to be lifted up. Go down to verse, um, verse 11. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. So earthly Jerusalem or heavenly Jerusalem? How many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? How many say earthly Jerusalem? How many say heavenly Jerusalem? How many won't raise your hand because you're afraid you'll be wrong? <laughs> it's on earth. Read it. It's not a trick question. The Mediterranean, the Dead Sea, a river, the plateau. It's over there right now. So how many say it's an earthly Jerusalem now? Or are you right? You are so smart. I feel like I'm teaching the third grade. <laughs> or junior high. <laughs> And uh, now I don't even know what verse I was reading. Uh, verse 11, and men shall dwell in it. There shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Now, I, I had maps in the afternoon, but I don't have them here. So you're going to you're gonna have to follow me. So picture this. Here is where we are, the church age, when the people of God are building churches, winning souls, and training families for God. The trumpet sounds, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. We which are alive and remain will be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And um, then we are in heaven, marriage supper of the Lamb, praise the Lord, judgment seat of Christ. We're rewarded according to our works. Our sins were judged 2,000 years ago on Calvary. And we're up in heaven enjoying it. We're probably going to see much of the tribulation because John saw much of the tribulation. And so seven years of tribulation going on down the earth. And then Jesus comes back and we come back with him. During that tribulation, the, Israel, the people of Israel are going to be persecuted beyond words. Uh, very tragic, tragic days. And remember, remember when Jesus said, um, I was in prison, you visited me. 
I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. And they said, when saw we thee hungry or naked or in prison or whatever? And Jesus said, in much as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. That's probably talking about right here at this moment. Because during this tribulation time, those who treated Israel right are going to be blessed and those who treat him wrong are going to be in big trouble. Um, at this time, uh, there's another one of the parables where Jesus talked about nations mistreating Israel. And uh, just say this, pray we get good leadership because we are on our way to some big trouble in America. Uh, you can't have the, the evil going on in our country and not have God judge our nation unless there's a whole bunch of God's people humbling themselves, praying and seeking God's face. And uh, what God does is obviously it's all mercy, but... Um, just aborting the babies we, we, we have in our country. And, and uh, so Sodom and Gomorrah deserves an apology if we are not about to be judged. And again, it only took, would have taken 10 had, uh, had Lot had, 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 they had 10 righteous people that would have been spared. And so that's what church is all about. So it's souling. Don't worry about the, don't worry about the crowd of people doing whatever they're doing. They're not the problem. The problem is the churches. That's why we're running buses. That's why we're teaching Sunday school. That's why we go to the jails. That's why we go to the rest homes. Because we want to see people saved, baptized, growing in grace. Because if God sees enough righteousness, it's like salt. The salt savors. The salt preserves. But our country's in big trouble. Um, and when we start mistreating Israel, it, that could be the last straw. So here's the end of the tribulation. Jesus comes back. You come back. If you don't like riding horses, you will then. And then Jesus sets up a thousand-year reign on earth. Now follow this. A thousand-year reign. If you look in Revelation, at one point it says we shall reign with him a thousand years. And then later it says we shall reign with him forever. Why does it say that? Because the end of the thousand years, he sets up his eternal kingdom and there'll be people reigning. So the reign and rule with Christ. So there's two different reignings here. And that's why you want to know where you are and what you're doing. Now, what we're looking at right here in verse, um, verse 13, it shall come to pass that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold, uh, oh, I'm sorry, verse 12 is where we were. Uh, there shall be a plague that the Lord will smite the people that have fought against Jerusalem. And I love this verse. I can hardly wait for us to see it. Every junior higher their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. Their eyes shall consume away in the, their holes and their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. That's just to me, that is just like, you know, that, I don't know, it's gruesome and horrible. It's like a good scary movie. Not that I watch scary movies, but it looks like it would make a good one if Hollywood got a hold of it. But anyway, they'd probably make them the heroes. Verse 14. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel and great abundance. Now, what we're looking at right here, and I'm not going to fuss with anybody about it, but I think at the end of the tribulation, um, the, the battle of Armageddon, all the nations, um, they're at the end of the end, later after Armageddon, all the nations are going to circle around Jerusalem, giant battle, and the Lord Jesus is going to show up and help Israel and go and wipe them all out. But all those people that came to cause trouble to Israel, they're in big trouble. Now, where are we? We're with the Lord. We live, we're up in heaven, okay? Now, when I say heaven, this is the complicated thing. So far, we haven't seen golden streets, gates of pearl, crystal mansions. That comes down at the end of Revelation. Just keep, hold that thought. I'm not confusing you. I'm not tricking you anything. I just want you to think. Let's, let's look and think, all right? So um, let's finish up in, in uh, Zechariah. Um, look at verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left. So if, if there's some people left, then a whole bunch of people aren't left. Y'all with me? That means they're right-handed. That is not what it means at all. It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem. Think, think, think. I know it's Wednesday night. It's horrible to have to think on a Wednesday night. So there's a whole bunch of people that came against Jerusalem. And we just read a minute ago that their eyes are going to burn up and their tongue's going to burn up and skin's going to melt off their flesh, right? And then he says, all of them that are left. So some of that crowd... You know, just one of their arms is going to burn off and one of their eyes is burned out and their tongue's dragging and, you know, they can't taste chocolate anymore. It's like suicide for that. Um, so there's some people left. Are, we, are you all good with that? I'm just reading it. 
So a whole bunch of people fought against Jerusalem. Jesus helps them burn their hides. And then along comes those that are left. Okay, let's keep reading. Whatever verse we're on, start there. Verse 16, it's come to pass that everyone that is left of all the who. So there's a whole bunch of nations involved in this thing. Okay, which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And there's way more involved in that than I can talk about. We'll just summarize it by this. These nations and these people that are left, they have to come to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Tabernacles. Just, just trust me with that. And they are mandated. Now, we're in, the, we're in the kingdom age. We're in the, the millennium or the eternal kingdom, depending on where you want to put it, and I won't fuss anybody about it because you're not going to remember anyway. Out there in the future somewhere, after we've been raptured, after we've come back. And so now let's go on. Verse 17. And it shall come to pass that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth. There are people all over the world. They are required to come up to Jerusalem to worship. Um, shall uh, of all the families of earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king capital K the king the Lord of hosts you think Jesus might be there I think he's there that's looked pretty good to me being the king the Lord of hosts even upon them shall be no rain and uh, so they're, they're, those nations are going to be judged you don't show up to worship no he's just shutting the spigot off you ever wonder why California is so dry it's a, oh, what, a, oh, what a foretaste of drought divine on and on, the end of verse 18, same thing, the, the, the people that don't come up to keep the Feast of the Tabernacles and on and on. Now, so what we're talking about is an earthly kingdom, an earthly king, a place the people of the world, the families of the world can come and worship, a place people can come and, uh, and seek after God. All right, now let's go back to Zechariah chapter 47 where we were a minute ago. Zechariah chapter 47. This will throw off your, uh, your heavenly vision because, you know, most of us, we think about heaven. You think, oh, so-and-so went to heaven. And you, so where, where are they? And what are they doing? And who are they with? And, and, you know, we have this kind of this vague, we don't really know. And so I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to paint a picture here for you. Um, look at chapter 47. Now, we're talking about a heavenly Jerusalem or earthly Jerusalem. It's not a trick question. Heavenly Jerusalem or earthly? Earthly. Okay, just so you know. Who was told that their seed would inherit the earth? Abraham. Jesus went to prepare a place for who? For us. The bride of Christ went away. This new Jerusalem, because the new Jerusalem is not the old Jerusalem. So we got two Jerusalems. Look at chapter 47 and verse 12. We're in Ezekiel 47. <clears throat> I'm sorry, let's go back to verse 10. So we've already got things being healed by the waters running down in verse 9. In verse 10, it shall come to pass that fishers shall stand upon it from En Gedi even to En Eglim. So there are going to be people in this place who are what? They're fishing. Brother Record, will you be happy? They didn't say fly fishing, but I'm sure that would be permissible. If you wanted to go make a visit from the heavenly Jerusalem down to the earthly one and go fishing for something, that would be awesome. Um, you ever wonder, how do you have a bass or a trout derby and who catches the biggest fish in the new Jerusalem? It, it's just hard to understand all that. But um, down in the middle of verse, uh, verse 10, they shall be a place to spread forth nets um, and their fish shall be according to their, as their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. So just like the, the same fish that were in the Mediterranean are going to be in the Dead Sea now, and they're going to fish there. They're going to spread their nets on the rocks. This could be a very prosperous place. So we're talking about during the millennial reign of Christ, or even perhaps during the eternal reign, and they are fishing. Y'all good with that? On earth or in heaven? Earth. Okay, good. It's, work, it's on earth. Some of you are still wondering. How many of you just didn't get dinner and you just don't have an attitude like learning at all, okay? I didn't get any dinner and had been going and, and, and Mikey Payne and Trent came over and brought me Jack in the Box burgers and fries and, and a soda. But anyway, praise the Lord. And I did not share. Uh, verse, um, uh, let's go down to verse, um, there's too much here, verse 12. And by the river, so we got this river flowing out of the throne, by the river, upon the bank thereof, and on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for what? Meat, so we get to eat. 
Well, whoever lives there, I'm saying we probably shouldn't say that because we don't know where we are yet, do we? Whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It, uh, it shall, you, you, you can't eat, there's so much fruit in these fruit trees, you can't eat it all. It's like a zucchini plant. You keep picking them and they just keep multiplying. It's like the widow's pot of oil. Show me an apricot tree that does that. But anyhow, a verse, the middle of verse, uh, verse 12, and it shall bring forth new fruit according to his months because their waters, they issue out of the sanctuary. There's something about that water that makes everything prosperous. So we got fishing, we got fruit, we've got eating, and everything's healed and everything is just hunky-dory, all right? The end of verse 12, and the leaf thereof for the met, is for medicine. There's healing in the leaves. Um, verse 13, thus saith the Lord God, this shall be the border whereby they shall inherit the land according to the 12 tribes of Israel. We're gonna, not going to read through that, but he describes Zebulon gets this land and Issachar gets this land and, and Gad gets this land and Reuben gets this land. And he's dividing the land up again, just like he did back in the day of the judges or in, in Joshua when he divided the land. And so the land is being divided. But So who's living there, Jew or Gentile? Jew, you're sure? Trick question. Go to verse um, 22, then I'll show you the trick question. Look at verse 22. And it shall come to pass that ye shall divide it for by lot for an inheritance unto you and to the stranger. The Gentiles get in on this thing. You want to talk about a good God. Now, where are you? Are you on earth? So what Gentiles are on earth? Those that got through the tribulation, whose eyes didn't melt and tongue didn't melt and skin didn't melt, and those that remain come in and they got to go worship every year at the Feast of the Tabernacles. Are we all good? We read all this, right? I can't tell you all the details. I can just tell you what I can read. So of the nations that fought against Israel, so these are not Jews. Are we okay? Rattle your head if you're with me. At the end of this, you say, Pastor, I didn't get one thing. It's not that hard. It's just not what you learn from Casper and Mickey Mouse or Minnie or whoever she it is, okay? Um, so these nations that stood against Israel, most of them got burned up and consumed. Some of them got through those that were, that were left alive, those that remain. They had to worship every year at the Feast of the Tabernacles. And so these are from the nations now. So these are Gentiles or Jewish people. And look at that verse now. Look at what we're, we're, we're reading there in verse 22. And it shall come to pass that ye shall divide it um, uh, by a lot to an inheritance you and to the strangers that sojourn among you, which shall, uh oh, this is going to throw you off, which shall beget what? They're going to have babies. Now, is that throwing off your theology or what? It's you ladies, it's like the Mormons, you're going to be eternally pregnant. <laughs> Are we talking about the bride of Christ or Israel? Heavenly Jerusalem or earthly Jerusalem? So, we're in the heavenly, or close. We'll get that in a minute. We've got earthly city Jerusalem, earthly river, earthly Dead Sea, earthly Mediterranean, earthly nations. Those nations that didn't get burned up, they got to come every year and worship. If they don't worship, their land faces a drought. Those nations that do come and worship, if they will choose to sojourn there rather than go back to Egypt, Ethiopia, Wildemar, God will let them have some of the land. God's awesome. These people were his enemies. But if they will turn to him, he says, you're in. We got, we got a great God. That's better treatment than you get from the average Christian. Anyway, we won't get off on that. Whole bunch there. Um, and so some of that crowd, they're going to be having babies. Say, Why? They must have marriage, and they ain't men. All right, men don't have babies. Look at verse 23. And it shall come to pass that in what tribe that stranger sojourneth there shall you give him his inheritance, saith the Lord God. Now what we're looking at is the earthly inheritance for the Jew 
and those Gentile nations that sneak in like, like Rahab did. Rahab wasn't a Jew, but she got in on the genealogy of Christ. And, and so, that, and I think that's a picture. Now, let's, let's go to us. Look over to the book of Ephesians. All right? That's, that's what's going on on earth. Let's look at what's going on in heaven. All right? Uh, find Ephesians chapter 1. Now, don't teach this in your third grade Sunday school class, all right? Just, just, just tell them Jesus loves them, all right? And, and if somebody says, we're all going to go up to heaven with Abraham and Sarah, don't say, oh, no, no, Abraham gets the earth. Don't do that. It's okay to just say they're, they're going to heaven. Just relax. Don't, you don't have to be theologically perfect. This, we we want to understand how to rightly divide the word of truth that's what what paul told timothy study to show yourself approved uh workman and needed not to be ashamed rightly dividing figure this thing out but but he also said jesus, jesus said i have many things to say unto you but you're not able to bear them wisdom is you knowing what people can can take and the value of it all but anyway oh, there's so much to do uh, ephesians chapter one all right you with me in ephesians one look down at, at verse 20 or verse 19 Ephesians 1 19 and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us we're talking about God who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he God wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the what heavenly places now we were talking over here about an earthly Jerusalem an earthly river an earthly lake an earthly sea earthly fishing earthly fruit trees earthly all kinds of great stuff people having babies people worshiping and all that kind of stuff now we're over here and Jesus when he rose from the dead they raised God raised him and set him in the heavenly places all right you all with me on that let's go to verse uh, uh, go over to chapter 2 look down at verse 6 again I'm skipping a lot you can read through in between but just to get specific here chapter 2 verse 6 and uh, verse 5 and 6 even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ so we just read about how God raised Christ right so he quickened us together with Christ by grace you're saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in where heavenly places in who in Christ Jesus now when you got saved Christ moved inside you in the person of the Holy Spirit, and I can't explain it any easier than I can explain the deity of Christ, the deity of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and the deity that God is God the Father and, and, and all that. There's some things you just believe, but when you got saved, the Lord moved inside you, but you became a part of him. The Bible says we are bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. We're baptized into the body of Christ. And so if Jesus, where, where did chapter 1, verse 6 say Jesus is? He's seated in the heavenly places, right? And if you are in Christ, then where are you? You're already seated in heavenly places. So tell me, how can you lose your salvation? You, you would have to literally be ripped out of the body of Christ, torn out of your heavenly inheritance. It can't happen. And then he'd have to go with you. Because he lives inside you, and where Jesus is will make it heaven for me. So uh, it's obvious. The songs tell you the truth, okay? So in verse 6 of chapter 2, we were raised together to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Chapter 4, we're going somewhere. Chapter 4 of Ephesians. Look down at verse 8. Chapter 4, verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended. Now we've been talking about Christ raising from the dead in chapter 1. We, as when we get born again, we are spiritually raised and seated in heavenly places. Now we're talking about the physical resurrection of Christ, chapter uh, 4, in verse 8. And it says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Now follow me for a minute. Um, let's just take, um, since we have these good illustrations here, let's take this nice little dog. And the dogs do not go to heaven. There's no record of that. But um, let's just pretend this is the rich man and um, this rabbit is Lazarus. Okay. Um, so the rich man dies and Lazarus dies. Where does the rich man go? Hell. All right. This is the rich man, right? 
All right. The dog, the rich man goes to hell. Where does the rabbit go? Abraham's bosom. All right. They're within sight of each other. And since you are, um, we're watching people on TV or watching, we're going to use the different sides of the platform. So this is the hell side and this is the Abraham's bosom side. Remember when Jesus was on the cross with the, the uh, thief, he said, today thou shalt be with me where? In paradise, not heaven. Why not heaven? Because the atonement had not been made. The Old Testament blood sacrifice sufficed for forgiveness, but it could not take away sin. You read that in Hebrews 8. The blood of Christ takes away sin. And so those sacrifices that could never bring remission, the biblical term, but they, they got them this far. And they were on layaway. They were on hold. They were on back order. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. And so they could holler back and forth, right? Remember the rich man said, Abraham sent Lazarus over that he may dip his finger and on and on. And Abraham said, there's a great gulp. But, but they're chatting or they're yelling. I don't know. Maybe they had megaphones, karaoke boxes, whatever it might be. But and then. So we just now read, now that he ascended in Ephesians 4, 8, now that he ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth and led captivity captive? Who was captive? Little bunny here. Everybody who was in Abraham's bosom, everybody who's in paradise, they got to go with Jesus. Now, if Abraham was there, you think maybe there's some Jews there? Probably a whole bunch of Jews probably Rahab and a whole bunch of non-Jewish people who chose, remember the, when they left Egypt and put the blood above the door? You, you know, there's a mixed multitude that put blood on the doorpost when they left Egypt because they knew Moses was right. So whoever did what they were supposed to do, they're in this place over here. Jesus is crucified here on the cross. His body laid in the tomb. His soul goes down to this side. Remember reading in Peter, we don't have time to turn there, when it says that he, he, he preached to the prisoners, the people from, from uh, Noah's day? He did. Hey, you guys, you really messed up. And then he led captivity captive. So today, this side is empty. So, who was in here, Jew or Gentile? Probably both, but certainly a lot of Jews. This side, a lot of Jews there too. They're still there. This side's empty. When Jesus led captivity, gave gifts unto men. Now look, look at that verse again in verse, verse 8. It says, uh, how does that verse start? Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? So Jesus comes down, he leads captivity captive, and, and all these Jewish people, and, and certainly I would assume some Gentile people, they went to wherever Jesus is. Everybody with me on that? So in Ephesians 1, where did God raise Jesus? He seated him in what? Heavenly places. So so all these people that were in paradise, where'd they go? Heavenly places, right? They're up there with Jesus. Paul the apostle said in 2 Corinthians, he said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So from the cross, well, this microphone stands the cross, prior to the cross, without the blood being shed, they went to paradise. After the blood was shed, uh, he offered the blood. All these people get to go up to heaven, a whole bunch of Jews, a whole bunch of Gentiles. Now you get saved, Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter who you are, you go straight to heaven. Why? The blood had been shed. The atonement had been made. And so, and where are these guys? Still in hell. All the little doggies, I'm sorry. Not really. He represents the rich man. 2,000 years he's been in hell. Going to stay there. Now wait a minute. Here's the question for you. Moses was promised that he would inherit, his seed would inherit the, the earth, right? And the bride of Christ gets the what? The, what kind of Jews, Jerusalem? New Jerusalem or the heavenly Jerusalem. So there's this big party going on up there. Everybody's having a great time together. And God says, hey, time to go home. Kind of like, you know, you've had the kids and the grandkids over and they've been there long enough. I think about Andy and Christina. 
20 years from now, all the kids, all the grandkids, 47 people. And Andy says, look, time for you to go home. <laughs> Where do the Jewish people go? They inherited the earth, right? It wasn't that what Abraham was promised. And where do you get to go? We're going with the king. All right, follow me. You, you, some of you, are, you, obviously, some of you need to read your Bible more. <laughs> Look over to Hebrews 11. I'm sorry. It's been a long day. <laughs> and it's only day one of vacation Bible school. <laughs> Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11. I love, I love studying. And, um, and I knew most of our teenagers wouldn't be here, and this is, a, this is a good night to do this. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. In verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promise, singular or plural? Plural, promises. Promises to Abraham, seed, as the stars of heaven, the land, uh, the whole world be blessed, and all that. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, and embrace them, confessing that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they'd come out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. That's all talking about Abraham, Abraham's seed, and the, the uh, Israelites leaving Egypt and all the worldliness involved there, right? Y'all with me on that? Now, but look at verse 16. But when? Now. We're not talking Old Testament now. Now we're talking now. But now they desire a better country that is a what? Heavenly. This crowd, we're looking for an earthly Jerusalem. But the one they saw Solomon and David had was not the one they wanted. They wanted one where the king was king. But now we desire a heavenly. And this is where you get so confused because you start reading about Jerusalem. Well, which Jerusalem? Is Mount Zion on the side of the north, the city of the great king? Which Mount Zion? We're going to read that in a minute. I'll confuse you some more before we're done. But now, verse 16, they desire a better country that is a heavenly. You know, the, the heavenly Jerusalem, that place is yours. That's our inheritance. Wherefore, the middle of verse 16, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Didn't Jesus say, I go to prepare a place for you? All right, he's prepared for them a city. Um, go over to chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12. And again, just for the sake of time, I'm skipping some things, but I think you can follow. Look at chapter 12 down at verse 22. I'm sorry, verse 21. Hebrews 12, 21. And so terrible was the sight. So he's talking about Moses. When Moses at Mount Sinai and the lightning and the thunder and the, the, the noise and it scared everybody to death. So verse 21, so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake, but ye. Now, just like before, under Abraham's seed, they were looking for this earthly kingdom, but now there's a heavenly. Now in verse, uh, verse uh, 21, they were scared to death, but ye, verse 22, you're coming to Mount Zion. Now look at this, Mount Zion, and under the city of the living God. Now, let you, I'd like you to list with me the things you come to. See, when you come to Wildemar, you come to the Arco Station, Jack in the Box. There's not a whole lot, but when you come to Mount Zion, look at what you come to. You are come to Mount Zion compared to an earthly mountain that was on fire. You're coming to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. So first of all, it's the city of the living God. Secondly, it's the heavenly Jerusalem. So now we know we've got a heavenly Jerusalem, we've got an earthly Jerusalem. That's, we're talking about the heavenly one now. To an innumerable company of angels. So when you come, when, when we come home, we're coming to the city of God. We're coming to that uh, the, the, the Mount Zion of God. We're coming to a heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels. We're going to get there and there's going to be angels you could not number for the multitudes. Remember in Revelation chapter 3, chapter 4, the multitudes fall down and they're crying out and around the throne they're crying out, holy, holy, holy. And there's millions of angels and millions of believers and they're all crying out, glory to God. You know what? A little girl heard a lesson on heaven. Her mom said, so what would you learn about heaven? She said, it's noisy. 
and it's going to be noisy. None of this, none of this very solemn, quiet place. A numeral company of angels. Look at verse 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Now, some people mistakenly separate those things, and they're not separated. That is one thing. I've heard people say that there is the general assembly. That's believers in general. And then there's the church of the firstborn. That's the Baptists. And if you're a Methodist that's saved, you're in the general assembly. But if you're a Baptist, you're a part of the church of the firstborn. No joke. I heard one of the most well-known preachers, or one of the very well-known preachers in America, preaching that. I thought, there ain't no way. And I went through it grammatically. I went through it theologically. And I even sent it to Mrs. Bailey. I don't know if she's in here tonight. But I sent it to her. I said, check the English grammar on that. She said, oh, yeah. She said, you're right on that. Of course, I'm right. <clears throat> she expects her next paycheck. I'm right. But uh, to the general assembly, no comma, and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. You know what that is? You're coming to the place where the believers go, those who've trusted Christ, those that are born again. And when you come to that heavenly Jerusalem, whether you come um, down the road, when you come, and we'll talk about that in a second if we can get to it, you're coming home. Jesus is there. God's there. Gazillions of angels are there, and you're going to see the church of the firstborn gather together. You talk about a family reunion beyond words. Verse 23, at the end of it says, And to God, the judge of all, and the spirit of just men made perfect unto Jesus. We're going to see him, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkling of blood of speaketh better things than that of April, Abel. Um, verse 28. Wherefore, because, that's where you're going. Because this world's not your home, you're just passing through. Look at verse 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. You know why we should serve God? Because of where we're going. Because of who we're going to meet. Because of who we're going to be with in that city. This, this crowd that wants to get saved and just live like the world and act like the world, they don't understand where they're going. They don't understand who they're going to walk down the streets with. This crowd who says, you know, I, I, just, I just want all this world I can get. I'm saved. It ain't going to be pretty. So if you look back at verse 22... He says, Ye are come to Mount Zion. Remember, great is the Lord, Psalm 48. We sing it, great is the Lord, greatly to be praised, the city of our God. That's an Old Testament psalm. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. That's talking about the earthly Jerusalem, the city of the great king. What's this talking about? It's talking about a heavenly Jerusalem. You see how you can mix these verses up? We didn't get to the one. You, the, you know the verse says their sins and iniquities will I remember, remember no more? In chapter 8, it's talking about millennial Jews. In chapter 10, it's talking about the bride of Christ. It's really good to sort these things out, but we don't have time for that. That's some other day. It was supposed to be last week, and we ran out of time. Let me wrap it up with, with this. There's a wonderful kingdom God promised to Abraham. Is a wonderful kingdom God promised his bride. And every person from the time of Christ until the trumpet sounds that's, that gets saved, they get the heavenly inheritance. And so um, if you start getting confused and you, and you, you see a verse, um, you know what, you didn't, you weren't a good steward, so there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, you got that verse out of place. It's a good verse. It just doesn't belong here and uh, we want to be able to rightly divide things but I'll just tell you this if you're saved it's going to get good I'd suggest we all live for him let's pray bless us we pray father as we go and again we thank you for our church thank you for the faithful workers and you are worthy of everything and you're worthy of the heart and soul and wallet of every person here we ask for wisdom that we might serve you acceptably with godly reverence and fear. Help us to please you. We do ask for mercy, mercy on our church, mercy on our families. Help our kids, Lord. Help them to make good choices. Help them to choose Christ. May we live in such a way that our kids would want to follow you. Thank you again for all you do for us. In Jesus' name.
Amen. All right, God bless you. Thanks for being here tonight. And uh, Lord willing, if your kids are on a bus, hopefully they'll come back.